getting ready. Pray for us. I coughed about four, three or four hours last night, so you pray for me. And uh, you know, like David Ring used to, he he come here one time, held a revival and or had a concert here, and he made a little statement, and it, he said, yeah, "I didn't do that." <laughs> and these musical instruments will says uh, let us make them sound let us sound good with them but no you pray for us this is a song that again this is an old song that's all i know because i'm old june bug you are too said uh or we'll never grow old I have heard of a land on the far away strand. Is a beautiful home of the soul. Built by Jesus on high, where we never shall die. Is a land. Where we'll never grow, never grow, never grow in a land where we'll never grow. grow. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to come and share. And not only that, but the opportunity for us to 
actually go on a trip like this. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about it, and I'm going to try to talk fast, okay, because I want to give these young people a chance to share with you about their trip. Um, Keno wanted to be in here tonight, and I know you'd rather see a blonde, a blonde bombshell than myself up here, but she, sh who said amen? But she, <laughs> but she is shorthanded tonight in the kids' choir, and so she's covering that, and she wanted me to tell you as well, thank you uh, for the opportunity. Um, the trip, and I, I'm going to be honest with you, the trip through no uncertain terms was Kena's idea about a year ago. Her boss, some of y'all may know him, his name's Bruce Giles, he, he lives down here in Loudoun County. Uh, her boss at First Utility is on the board of this organization called Knox Pro Corps, kind of like, you know, Marine Corps, only Knox Pro Corps. And they're an organiza non-profit organization that assembles uh, engineers and, and scientists and different levels of people to go and serve in the mission field. And they actually have, where we went in Guatemala, there are two families living there now. One of them's from Nashville, one of them's from Knoxville. And we need to pray for them. They're called the, their names are the McKinney's. They have four children there right now under the age of eight in Guatemala. And the living conditions there are not like here. And I'll go into that in a little more detail. The the main organization is from, it's a Guatemala government organization called CAFNEMA. And they provide some of the funds, but they also need volunteers to come out. And our main project was to install and repair water line, water lines to this one village. Um, it's called, Sex, I'm going to tear this up, Sequix Per Guatemala, okay? And when you think of Guatemala, you think of hot and dry, and the picture he's getting ready to set up here is just a general picture from uh, a ride out to the village. But the actual village that we stayed in is in an area called the Cloud Forest. So it was cool, and it, I mean, it was very cloudy. Sometimes you couldn't even see the tops of the mountain. But this village has, it's, it's completely mountainous. You, you think that you see all the houses, but you don't see near the number of houses that are actually in this village. There's approximately 100 families in this village that we worked in this week. And, um, you know, I'll show you here in a minute, but just when you think you get to the top where there's the last person, there, you look up and there's two or three more houses up above you. And let me tell you what, I may look like I'm in shape, but I'm telling you, these chicken legs can only get me so far up and down a mountain. And I'm telling you, it was hard work, and I was really proud of, of Kena and, and the effort that she put in because she just didn't help with the kids around there, but she helped installing this water line. And, you know, it's, it's funny. It's something that we take for granted every day, but these, these folks, they didn't have any sanitation at all. They don't have any electricity. They don't have sewer, and we're bringing them water. I mean, what a, what a blessing that is. The people are just beautiful. So... I'm going to get into that in just a minute. How many of you have ever flown in a plane? Many of you. Okay. How many of you have ever flown out of the country in a plane? Okay. A few more. Okay. My wife, Kina, has never flown prior to this trip. Okay. So I knew it was important to her because she was willing to get on a plane. And I'm telling you what, she kept saying to me, Ryan, I need you to help me hold it together. Okay. But I, and I don't know if you know a lot about Guatemala, but Guatemala is a country right just south of Mexico. So it's uh, right there near the Yucatan. And it's extremely mountainous. And you're, we were coming in. It's a three-hour flight from Atlanta to Guatemala. And, and all I see is mountains. And I'm looking. I, you know, what can I do? Like I'm the pilot in the back row. Okay? And I'm looking for the airstrip. And I'm looking, I'm looking. And we're coming down. And he has to bank around. This is a 757, all right? It's a big, big plane. He's banking around. He keeps banking around, and I am just praying, and I am glued to the seat. And Kena's looking at me, and she said, this is normal, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's normal. <laughs> so I was the one that had the trouble with the flight, but we landed well. I mean, it was a little rough, but I held it together. And I'll tell you what, I did a lot of praying, but uh, we made it in. And really, a big part of the, the trip was transportation. We had at least three days uh, getting to and from the village and then we had four work days and let me tell you they were work days I wore the same pair of jeans every day because I got so muddy 
I didn't want to get something else made. And there was no, you know, there was no, uh, nowhere to take a shower, you know, where to get clean. So, uh, I mean, you know, we bathed in gold bond every night and uh, sanita you know, uh, sanitation wipes and stuff. Anyway, this is uh, the first picture. I'm going to say Jimmy here every now and then. So if you hear me say Jimmy, I'm not, not going crazy. I'm asking Jimmy to change the slide. Okay. So this is uh, on, on the bus from, from the airport to Coban. The first night we went to Coban and stayed in what Bruce told us was an excellent, a very nice hotel. Okay. Well, a very nice hotel in Coban is kind of like a Motel 6 here. Okay. So, you know, it take, takes some getting used to, okay, Jimmy? And as soon as we got, we spent the night in Coban, and just to give you an idea of, if, have, has anybody seen Ice Road Truckers? Have you seen that show? Oh, well, there's one where they go overseas, and they have these big trucks, and they're going around these cliffs, and you have to move out of the way for these other cars to go by, and you're looking out your window, and there's a cliff, okay? That's the road from Coban into the village. We rented three trucks to get from Coban to the village, and it's only 30 miles away, but it took two and a half hours to get there because it's all four-wheel drive terrain. You know, you're beating your head against the window. So, you know, it was an, this whole thing was an adventure. I was not prepped for this adventure, okay? But it was wonderful. As soon as we got there, this is what we get, these kids. I'm telling you what, they were fascinated by the gringos. And it, it seems like everywhere we went, they would say, gringo, gringo, gringo. They were just fascinated, and they were glued to you. They wanted you to take pictures of them, and we take pictures of them, and we show them, because, you know, they don't have mirrors and stuff. So they were fascinated by that. Okay, Jimmy. Just beautiful, beautiful people. And this village is actually a Mayan village. They're from, they have a Mayan descent. So they don't speak Spanish like the rest of Guatemala. They speak a language called Kachi. So me knowing a little bit of Spanish didn't really help. But it, it's, it's really unique because this village and, and the ones that are from Mayan descent are kind of, they're kind of looked down on by the rest of Guatemala. So it was extra special for us to go and be able to minister to these guys. Here is this, I don't know if you could tell it, but that, that thing that looks like a rock in the middle, that is a water tank that was installed on a spring at the top of a mountain, okay? And I don't know how that works. I don't know if it's a water volcano or what. I was shocked when they told me because that, that tank right there is about 6,800 feet above sea level, okay? The village is at 5,000 feet above sea level. And also, uh, I was really hoping Gary Massey, some of y'all know Gary Massey, Kim's, Kim Massey's husband, He's been on this trip twice, and he went this time as well. I was really hoping he'd be here tonight to share as well. But he went up to the tank every day that we were there. And I'm, you're talking a hike. So for that guy to be in that kind of shape, okay, you go to the next one. Here's just a, an example. I don't know if you could tell, but there's two guys down at the bottom of that hill. That's myself and Bruce Giles. And that white thing you see going up the mountain, that's the water line that we were installing. That's just one of them. We ended up putting in 3.7 miles of PVC pipe. And let me tell you what, I was never so glad to not smell glue <laughs> in my life than when that, day, when that trip was over. This is, this is them clearing the top of a mountain. They actually, the, you know, corn is really big down there. And so they'll clear the side of a mountain and put corn on it and work that land just like that. It's incredible. Here's some of the houses. This gives you an idea of what we did. The, the water tank was way above these houses here, and, we, and all the villagers dug all the trenches by hand. And I'm telling you what, you know, these guys are in shape. They're running around with these rubber boots on, very muddy, but they will scale that mountain like a billy goat, and they'll come flying by you. I'm sitting there, you know, struggling to get down, and they go, Phew! you know, they're taking off. They're in shape. So it's just, it's beautiful everywhere you look. And, it, you know, I got in trouble the first day because here we are trying to glue this pipe up. And I'm like, man, I got to get a picture. This is a picture. Bruce is like, Ryan, <laughs> you got to help me out here. So it was just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. That is a view from 
uh, our kitchen. Actually, one of the village elders allowed us to use his kitchen all week, and it's a different setup there. He's got a house, and then he's got his kitchen outside next to it. Well, in his house, he has, which is probably a little bit bigger than this stage, not much, he has 13 people living in that one house. Okay, no bathroom. The bathroom is a privet, uh, you know, a hole in the ground just 200 yards from the house. And then the kitchen. And I think I got a picture of that in a minute. There's another picture. Um, but the beauty of this uh, organization and the way they have this set up is you don't just go in and, you know, provide something for the villagers and leave. They actually form in the village a water council. And they will elect members to that. And you must pay to, to have a tap brought to your house somewhere to here. So, and not only that, but they train a technician in, either in that village or a nearby village to maintain it. Because you guys know that valves go bad and pipes break, et cetera. Well, it's only like, it's about $3 a month. And when we were coming into the village, there was supposed to be, I think there was 50 of them that were going to get taps. Well, nobody was paying. As we were coming in, nobody was paying. And then slowly they start paying. And the last day, one hour to go before we leave, here they come. They all start paying. <laughs> they realize and they're getting their tabs. So it, it's really a, a, a unique organization. Um, the, the village, the culture of the village, I'll just give you an example. There's two churches. There's a beautiful shot right there. I think we took a break. We were worn out. Um, in the village, there's two churches. There's a Catholic church and there's a Mennonite church. And we didn't get the opportunity to have service with them other than uh, you know, a really uh, brief prayer time. And it's unique because they pray, everybody prays at once out loud in their native language. And it was just, it was beautiful to see. Um, but they tell me that their services are, are kind of a unique blend of a little bit of Mayan culture and a little bit of Catholicism. And then they have, you know, the Protest the Protestant come in to it. So I really was hoping that we would be able to, to get some of that. But I did learn some of the language. I was able to talk to them, you know, even if it's just briefly you know, about God, and they, I, I just can't tell you how thankful they were for us being there, and what a blessing it was for us, just to, you know, I was worn out, but I would have, I would have kept going, I would have done it again, I would have stayed, you know, more days, because it was just so beautiful to get to know them, um, there's Kina, she actually did some work, and I, I, I want to take a picture of her, showing the beautiful countryside behind it, um, okay, Jim, there's this this is Alfonso and Carlos it was really unique because some of them in the village they all speak Quechi well sixth grade and under are learning Spanish you know I told you that they have they don't have sanitary they don't have they don't have sewer they don't have electricity and we're bringing them water but the crazy thing is they got cell phones I'm like you got a cell phone and they're popping up these cell phone towers everywhere around them so sixth grade and under are learning Spanish and the village elders are worried that they're going to lose you know some of their culture so these guys came out another part of the program was if you wanted to have water hooked up at your house then you needed to go help you needed to go help install these water lines so we I think this was the first day we met um, Alfonso uh, he's on the right and Carlos and it's it's just so it was just so neat, even though you don't speak the language, you know, a smile is universal. And, and when I came up, and I, they, they said, try to get to know him. And I'd say, you know, como se llama? They said, me llamo Carlos. And then after that, they wanted to know the English word, you know, for everything. So they were asking me all this stuff, you know, what's this? English. <laughs> so it was just really unique. And, and about, I guess about halfway in, we started training them on how to put the pipe together and from that point on it was kind of a kind of a quality control thing and we got to know the villagers and, and, and got to watch them work and man, I'll tell you what they work they work they didn't st they didn't want to stop they wanted to keep going uh, here's another uh, team member that went with us he's I think he's repairing the line there and there's that's me talking to Alfonso and Carlos Anytime, if you guys have questions at any time, just the, the kids there, um, Kena was just, it just broke her heart. 
meeting these kids. And what was so neat, this is uh, Hector and Freddie. And we met them one of the days they came out. And they followed us the whole day. It was so neat to see, you know, these kids. I think I could, you can kind of tell the kids are kind of looked down on in the village. So when they got attention from, from us, it was just smiles all around. Well, Hector and Freddie, once they learned Kena's name, and I guess because she's blonde, she's a blonde white woman, right? They, they don't see a lot of blonde girls. They would run ahead to the house, the, the next house we were going to, and they'd peek out and they'd go, Kena, Kena, because they learned her name. So, they, so she really got attached to, to Hector and Freddie uh, one of those days we were out working. Just beautiful, beautiful people. Here we are getting ready to put in uh, spigots. They didn't, they didn't bring the lines into the house. They all, those that got water, got a spigot on the outside. They call them churros. Spigot. Um, I did learn some kachi. They wanted to teach me once they got it glued up and it looked good. You know, I was saying, good job. And they said, no, shaville. Shaville means good job. So, you know, as soon as they got done gluing up, they go, shaville, Ryan. Shaville, Ryan. It's just funny. To, to see how much they wanted to learn and how much, how thankful they were that we were there. Here's us bringing in a line to an actual house. And it was the, the, la the second to the last day we were there, it was, it was kind of confusing because we had to take an interpreter with us because they had a list of those that had pay actually paid to get hooked up. Well, we, we went to a couple houses where they hadn't actually paid and we'd already you know, we already brought the line up there, so we had to we had to tap it off. So, you know, we didn't know what was going on. I didn't know, you know, somebody's gonna come out, you know, with a machete or whatever. Because they all, all the men, almost all the men have a machete. I mean, even the kids too. You know, you know, because they're always clearing a path or to get somewhere. So, you know, some of it was a little, you know, trust. I, you know, I got I got to trust these people. Here's the same uh, churro that we were hooking up. And, it, you know, they're just so grateful. So thanks, Hector and Freddie again. Um, they would come out and offer us a uh, cafe or coffee. And they would come out and offer us these other drinks. And they, and they told us, you know, don't drink it unless, you know, it's been boiled or cooked. And a lot of this stuff was hot. So we, they brought one out one time. It was a white, kind of milkish looking drink. And I was scared about it. And I, But they said, you know, don't insult them at least try it and I started drinking it and one of our other team members just downed it and it ended up being some kind of rice drink because it was kind of you know crunchy <laughs> I, don't, I don't know <laughs> I, I'm telling you it, it was an it was an experience okay it was an experience I didn't want to offend anybody but there's a, there was a beautiful shot of Hector and Freddie they were running ahead of us waiting for us to come on just beautiful children and here we are bringing down a, a box to set over the valve because we put valves down next to the path, you know, uh, that leads up to their house. So they all got valves and, and uh, those that got churros or spigots. Here we are setting up another, another spigot. And we taught them all how to do this. They were just, you know, it, it just blows your mind how we have something. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't even think about it. You know, we got water, and here we are bringing water to their house for the first time. And there's a view from that same from that same house. You can see a little bit of the trench. I don't know if you can see that trench there going up the mountain. But yeah, it. I'll tell you what. I was not I was not ready for for the walking. I really wasn't. I thought I was in shape. And I'll tell you what, Gary Massey. When you see him, and you just say. Right on, man, because he went to the top. I never made it to the top. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't do it. <laughs> I'll be on, I'm just being honest with you. Beautiful country. Hector and Freddie, they just wanted their picture taken all the time. They wanted to see it. Beautiful, beautiful people. We were up on uh, working on, or actually trying to get up to another tank one day, and uh, this little girl came up with her little sister and just wanted to see us. So she brought her up there and was just sitting there looking at us. You know, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't talk to him or anything. And then, you know, we took, uh, we took like granola and we took trail mix and we offered that a little bit. I didn't realize once you offer it to one, the word gets out <laughs> quick. Because so we offered it to one and it wasn't 20 minutes later, about 20 kids came up. And we're like, 
you know, so we ended up running out of trail mix a couple of days there. There we are training a couple of guys, just beautiful, beautiful people. Wonderful opportunity. I was not, I was not expecting, I mean, I did not know what to expect there, but it just, it just opened my eyes, really opened my eyes. I've done a lot of mission trips statewide, and, you know, I thought those, and I still think those are wonderful, but if I had the opportunity to take a group of young people, even my own children, to a place like this, you know, just to see, uh, you know, how, how God is everywhere, you know, and he can use you everywhere, and there's Hector and Freddie playing with a pipe, <laughs> setting up another spigot there, you can see the beautiful countryside, also very thankful, I think we're going to skip through these pretty quick, because I'm I think I'm taking up too much time. Okay. Kina said, I want to put together a churro. I want to put together a spigot. So she got the opportunity to actually get hands on and put together. There she is taping up, taping up the end, getting ready to put it together. So she really worked. I was proud of her. We slept in uh, a tent all week. Well, four days, four days and four nights. We spent in the village. And when the first night we got there, pouring down rain, and we were down here, and Juan's house is up the hill, and they dug steps out of the mud, okay? And about three-quarters of the way up is the women's privet, the women's bathroom. So you can imagine, <laughs> you can imagine having to get up, go to the bathroom at night for Kena. But I'll tell you what, it was, I went out, I went out one night, and it was clear, um, and I just walked out. We were under this canopy. I think I got a picture of that here in a minute. And I looked up, and I'm telling you what, I have never seen more stars in my life. It was the most beautiful thing. I think I saw like 20 shooting stars just in that five minutes I was out there. And I was just, just a great time for me to pray and thank God for the opportunity he gave me. Uh, the lady on the left there, her name is Tata. She was, she's actually lived in the States for a while. She was... She was uh, severely beaten as a young child and brought over to the States and actually grew up uh, in a loving home over here. But then she had to go back. And right now they're trying to get her back in the States now because she's a wonderful lady. She was our cook for the week. So we actually did, you know, we were all kind of hesitant about eating, eating the food there. So we brought in, they brought in Tata to cook for us all week. So we had some Americanized food that was, you know, a little better on the gut, because <laughs> I didn't know what to expect there. Okay, um, let's see, I think I got one more picture in there of the team, no, not, I don't have a team picture in there, okay, okay, that's all right, we'll, we'll go to YEC now, we'll talk about that, I'm going to ask these young people, oh, Jake's here, wonderful, if they would come on up, anybody have any questions about the trip? Yes, sir. Um, that was through several fundraisers um, that we had. We brought a lot of the pipe there. There's the men's privet right there. And that, that's where a lot of the guys stayed. Um, CAFNEMA, which is an organization through uh, the Guatemalan government, provides for some of it. Um, but a lot of it was, was through Knox Procore. And they did a lot of fundraisers for those, for people to go, and for uh, the equipment, the uh, supplies there. That, can you back up one? Yes, sir. There is actually a spring on top of the mountain. And they said this spring was so strong that it's, it could actually feed more than one village. So we actually ran some line out past the village so for another project to come in and bring water to another village. This is actually about halfway down the mountain. They have to set up these pressure relief tanks. It's all gravity fed, but there's so much pressure that they have to have these blowout tanks so they don't blow out somebody's line further on down. Um, okay, if you'll scroll on through. There's some, uh, there's the, back up, or yeah, right there. There's the, the little girl that came up and brought her little, sister up just to see us she wanted to see us and that's the one we fed there's a trench on top of the mountain that was the highest I could go that's midday I don't know if you could tell it wasn't raining it's just the clouds 
You're, I, I felt like I was in a movie. I thought it was, I was in Gorilla in the Mist or something. And there's the trenches going up and some pipe being laid right there. That's what I got to see every morning as I was eating breakfast, getting ready to go out. There's our tents. That's where we slept every night. There's some guys working. There's, I think that's Kena going up the mountain right there. That's one of the houses. We got up to the top, and it was so high up. And we, as soon as we got up, there was a horse right there. I'm like, I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> Not only that, but it, th this was one of the houses that wasn't on the approved list, so we had to cap it. And run back down really fast, <laughs> just in case. Uh, go ahead there, Jimmy. This is uh, in Coban. I, you know, not ever being in a foreign country, I didn't know what to expect. So it was really, you know, I mean, just the infrastructure and seeing the, the architecture and the buildings. and It was just unique to me. Okay. And then, hey, uh, this is this right here is Antigua. We got a few hours to go to a tourist spot, and this is Antigua, which is about 45 minutes from Guatemala City in the airport. But the the cool thing about Antigua is it's got three volcanoes, and that that one right there is dormant. Two two of them are dormant, but one of them's active. And so on the way down to Antigua, I said, Michelle, she's one of the team leaders. I said, What are we going to do if it erupts? She said, Well, the bus is ready. <laughs> so. <laughs> You know, it's just a whole new experience there. And here, the last picture here is the team that went. Uh, there's some villagers uh, mixed in there, too. But I'm telling you what, guys, it was a, an incredible, incredible experience for us. And I'm just so thankful that we were able to go and, you know, be the hands and feet, you know, that God desires us to be, uh, even in Guatemala. I never, I never would have expected. Um, to be honest, I was worried about this trip. Keenan was the one that was the spark for me to go. I knew God was going to take care of us, and I knew God was in this. But I, I'll be honest, I was nervous. <laughs> I was nervous about it. So, any other questions about that, about the trip or anything? Temperatures. In, in the village, it got down, I think it was close to 38 one night, because I woke up in that tent, and I was I mean, I had all my clothes on. I was in a sleeping bag, but it was cold. In the daytime, if the sun came out, it, it approached 70, 70 degrees. But it's not like the rest of Guatemala, which as soon as we got back down, going to Coban and Guatemala City was hot. It was really hot. So it was, I mean, it was adventurous all around. Uh, I will never forget it. Everywhere you went, you know, in that village, people were just so thankful that you were there, and, and I've never had somebody take, you know, such an interest in, in knowing about us. You know what I mean? It's just, it's beautiful, beautiful time. Yes, they do. They grow their own food. They had, they grow a lot of coffee. They grow a lot of beans. Um, they grow a lot of corn. Almost everything is corn. Um, the men would go out and help during the day and work. Most of the women stayed in the house all day, and they're doing this all day, making tortillas. Uh, most of the, I, I learned while I was there, there's another organization that goes to Guatemala to help provide uh, wood-burning stoves because all the houses have an indoor open fire in the house, and it's burning all the time. So evidently there's been several kids that have fallen into these fires and you know, either been killed or been hurt uh, fairly bad, so. That was unique, you know, and, and, and seeing 13 family members live in, in a little house all together, you know, from, from little kids all the way up to great-granddad, you know, all together. It was, it's an eye-opening experience. It really is. You know, I've heard about these things all my life, but, but to actually go and experience it and see that God, you know, he's working even in a place like Guatemala is just beautiful. Any other questions? Yes, they have. Uh, actually, we, we got in a fight with a cow on the way in the village in one of our trucks. So they all have, you know, cattle. Uh, almost all of them had pigs or chickens. Uh, some of them had horses. And these are valued items to them, very valuable. Um, as far as wildlife, I, we didn't see a lot. I saw one snake one day. Um, the state bird is, and I hope I don't mess this up, it's called the Quetzal. 
Q U E T Z A L. So it's also the currency. We call it Q. I think the ratio is eight Qs to a dollar. So we had to learn some of that, you know, while we were in Antigua. It's a totally new experience to me. Um, beautiful countryside. Everywhere you went, it was just gorgeous. You know, you just wanted to sit and just stare forever. But the odd thing is they're popping all these cell towers up, <laughs> kind of marking the countryside. So, yeah, it was wonderful. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yes. They have, they actually have uh, a ministry that comes in, I think, once a week. We didn't see them while we were there, but there's a medical mission team that comes in. It's funny that you bring that up because as soon as we got there, there was a couple of older villagers that came up and they were smiling and they had braces. I was like, she's got braces. What's going on? <laughs> so they have dental teams, they have medical teams that come at least uh, once a week. They have a school there, and the unique, the funny thing about the school was that every morning you see all these kids going to school, but a little while later I saw all the grammar kids, not even an hour later, coming back. Well, they, they don't know when the teacher's going to show up. They don't know if they're going to have a teacher for the elementary. They don't know if they're going to have a teacher for, you know, the high schoolers. So, you know, it's just, it's just different. It's just different. But they do have teams that come in, provide clothing. I was telling Kena I had never seen so many Abercrombie and Fitch shirts or Hollister shirts because they all, you know, they all have donated uh, clothing, clothing items and stuff. So it was, it's just, I, I don't know what to say. It's just beautiful people. Every, every time, you know, I'd look out, somebody was smiling at me or want to, want to try to communicate, you know, so it's beautiful. Anybody else? Any other questions? Okay, well, we're going to shift gears just a little bit. I'm going to ask them. We, we have a sprinkling of them that showed up tonight. I know a lot of them had uh, for YEC. By the way, YEC stands for Youth Evangelism Conference, and it's been going on at least for 30 years. Jerry told me he went when he was a teen, and that was how long ago, Jerry? <laughs> so Youth Evangelism Conference, once a year, every year in Nashville, um, all, well, as many as you can, teenagers from Baptist churches across the state and we come and we worship uh, it's just a beautiful incredible time for these young people to get together with with peers across the state and I mean each service was 10,000 people in there we took uh, 22 a lot of them had to take off of work in order to go to this so they unfortunately had to work tonight so we have some of them here I hope they're going to share about their experience because we have a lot of first timers First time they go. Um, and for many of them, I think, I'll let them explain, but for many of them, I think it's kind of a shock to their system because, you know, they've never been around this many young people to worship. And not only that, but but almost every time they have an invitation, you will get 100, 200 people to come down and get saved. I mean, to see something like that, it's just it just blows you away, you know, to see God move in through their lives, and you can just feel, uh, you know, you can feel the energy, you can feel the spirit moving through these young people. So I'm asking them to come up now, give them an opportunity to share uh, and speak, and take back over. Okay, are you ready? Okay, um, I actually want to start off by asking you all a question. Um, how? <laughs> Been two days with him. Don't even. Um, okay. <laughs> How many of y'all have been to church and, well, obviously you've been to church, but um, gotten a service where the pre you feel like the preacher is directly talking to you? Anybody? Me? Yeah. That happened to me. Let me ask you another question. Have you ever, like, talked to somebody and what they say just feels like it slaps you in the face? You're just like, oh, Okay. Has anybody felt that before? Is that just me? No? Okay. Yeah, that happened to me too. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know, I've been struggling with depression pretty much the past almost two years. And one of the things that the guy said was, 
you're not alone. And with God, you are not alone. And that that was just like a wake-up moment for me because I was like, I feel alone all the time. I mean, like, I know all my friends are here. I know all of you are here for me. I know you all would do anything for me. I know. Um, but I just felt so alone, like something was missing, I guess. Um, so I, just, I was just like, maybe I just need to, like, pay attention and listen and see what I can find out. And for the past, since yesterday, I really haven't felt alone because I've been, like, praying and I've, like, actually opened up to what God has had to say to me. And I actually don't feel alone anymore. And I think that's, like, awesome. That's, like, an awesome feeling, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. And I met, like, some of the most awesome people there. Like, there was, like... Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, like me and him went down into like, I want to call it a mosh pit, but it really wasn't a mosh pit. Um, like the floor, the front of the stage, but like in front of the stage. And like with a bunch of people, we just started playing ninja and we just kind of jumped in and we, nobody felt like a stranger to each other. It was awesome because I'm like an outgoing person anyway. So I'm just like, hey, what's up? And it, usually people are like, mm -mm, I don't want to talk to you. But they were all just like, hey, what's up? It was awesome. Um, yeah, so. Um, yeah, that's really all I had to say. Uh, this is my second time going. I went last year. Last year it really spoke to me, but this year it was really more different. Because this time I actually listened. Last time I didn't really listen, but. This time I actually did, and they gave me a, they gave me a book, and that book was, I read, they were only supposed to read one chapter or not, but I read two. <laughs> yeah, I actually read, Jake. I, I got home, when I was on my way home, I thought, you know, I really need to read this book, see what it has to say, and as I was reading it, it just got, it just got more and more into me. It actually really does speak to you really much. Like, even that guy talking, you know, he, he did speak to everybody, and every, I know everybody felt some. I don't think you could have went to that and not felt something. I fe felt something all the, the whole time, and uh, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it last year, and I really enjoyed it. I want to keep going as long as I can. So I liked it. I don't know about them, but I did. Well, this, this time was my first year going since I've been in youth, and on, on the way up there and before Ryan started talking about I thought it was like go be kumbaya around a campfire or something. <laughs> kumbaya, oh Lord. <laughs> You're welcome. So, I mean, God really put it on my heart, and... I probably misplaced the book by now. I don't know where it went. It's probably in my room. I don't know. But God really opened up, and it wasn't kumbaya around a campfire, so it was much better, and that's my story. Kumbaya, yep. really. Yep. Okay, let me start off by saying, yes, Sarah, we met some awesome people there. Me, like, as soon as we got there, we were, like, down in the, I guess, mosh pit area, the stage area or whatever. They were hit on me. But anyways, <laughs> back to what I was going to say. Um, this year was so much different for me than last year or the year before when I went. Because up till now, I've been kind of putting God, not even in the back of my mind, like, just putting him aside, like, just away from everything and been ignoring him and get involved with the wrong people and all this other stuff but when I went the uh, like Sarah said there was this, the speaker there he was talking about stuff and everything he said just kind of applied to me and it was like God was pretty much smacking me in the face saying hey listen and when he called down for invitation some people say when they get saved, they hear like a voice or something. It's not like that at all. I Like, as close as he possibly could get to physically pulling me down there is what it was pretty much. 
And on my way down there, I just, I, I completely lost it. I broke down and started crying, like, a lot. And when I was down there, I lifted my hands up, and I felt God grabbing me. Like, he was grabbing me, saying, come here. And as I was walking back, you can ask Ryan about this, I was just, I, I was shooken up. I was sitting there bawling. You couldn't really understand what I was saying. But it was the most awesome feeling that I've ever felt in my entire life. That's really all I have to say. Um, this year was my first year going, and like they said, it felt like the speaker was speaking directly to you. And I just, I could feel that God was with us. And everything that he said applied to me, like the way that I should be acting, but I'm not. And it was really fun, and it really helped me. This year was my first year also, and it was a good experience. And it's like God really spoke to me. And just to see all those people who wanted to get saved and know Christ, it was just amazing. And I'm looking forward to going to it next year. Well, like everybody else said, you know, it's a, it's a good experience. You know, it's my first time going to. Uh, my heart was definitely open to God and the message through um, the speaker, you know. He was, it's like he's speaking directly to you. You understand, you know. I definitely listened more there than I usually do to listen to Eddie. <laughs> I usually, uh, I, I usually get a little distracted when I'm listening to Eddie. <laughs> Start thinking about food. <laughs> No, but uh, it, w it was a really good experience. I uh, had a lot of fun. Thank you. All right. Don't you love honesty? Well, I just want to say thank you very much, church, for giving us the opportunity. It's just, you know, I try to use any tool that we have available to reach out to these young people, and it's another tool that we can use. Uh, the speaker in the book that, that they mentioned, the speaker is David Nasser. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's a pastor in Birmingham, but he's originally from Iran. He has an incredible testimony, which he shared Friday night, and that's when many of them got saved. Saturday, there's two sessions, a Friday night session and a Saturday session. The Saturday session is when he talked about the book, and he gave us the challenge from Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, that talks about, you know, it's time for you to get off the spiritual milk. It's time for you to get on to the spiritual food. And a lot of these young people really responded to that. I took it to heart. You know, and, and this devotion is a springboard, a 20-day springboard for them to get, get back into it with God and to really understand that, you know, God is wanting to talk to you. And He's everywhere, and He wants, he wants you to listen for Him. And this is... Just a wonderful tool and opportunity for us to realize that, you know, there's teens out there that need God. And, and these guys, these guys can get into places that I can't get in their, in their school rooms, in their relationships. And there's people that will open up to them that won't open up to some of us. And this, the, the great thing is when these guys get it and when it clicks. And that, that's the beauty of it. So I want to thank you guys for the opportunity for us to go to Guatemala. I want to thank you for the opportunity for us, just the opportunity to take these young people uh, on a trip like this is a blessing for us all. So I, I pray that you encourage them, strengthen them. It's not easy being a teenager today. It's a different world, and you guys know that. But they're, they're trying to do it. They're trying to do it with God. So lift them up. I pray you encourage them and strengthen them. Yes. Junior. Thank you, Junior.